What's up, guys? I'm Emerald Marie, and be sure to check us out on the web at realfansrealtalk.com. This is your African King's Come, Michael Blackson. You're watching Real Fans Real Talk. Get real with it, my son. What's going on, guys? It's Legend of Two Games, repping real fans, real talk. Got a great friend of mine and a great friend of the show, Will, on the board sports. Love the jersey, man. We're about a week away from the draft, but before we get into all that talk, how are you doing, brother? I'm doing all right. You know, can't complain, but we're all in this quarantine and we're all in this together right now. So the main thing here is we just have to go out there and listen. We have to throw our views out on the president and everything like that out the window at this point. I'm not supporting, I'm not saying anything at all here with what's going on, but everybody's under under the gun right now at this point, you know? So let's just go out there and let's make the best out of a bad situation. I completely agree with you on that. Um, I think this is a time for unity, a time for us to stand together and understand that no matter what your political views are, the most important thing is that everyone come out of this healthy. Um, you know, so I definitely agree with you on that, man. How tough has it been? Um, you know, we, we've known each other a little over a year now. And in that time, you know, you, you're, you're not just a sports fan. You truly live it because, you know, you're at games. You're at Jets games, Islanders games, uh, Yankee games, right. you know, and then you travel with it as well. Last year, I believe you, you, you touched base in about, what, about five or six different major league uh, ballparks? Something like that. Yeah, something along those lines. You know, first and foremost, I'm an electrician. I'm a construction worker. I'm, I'm a regular working man. So, you know, that works in the five boroughs. And I'm fortunate enough to be a part of that. But also, too, you know, right now with everything that's gone on, uh, you know, going, going as a fan, going to see some places like Arizona and Colorado right when – this was all in its infancy at this point in time, watching the Islanders play. Uh, it was just absolutely unbelievable. But, hey, make no mistake about it, man. You know, we're all going through this. And if they're telling you to stay at home and there's a reason why, you know, we're going to be in indoors till May 15th in the New York area anyway, uh, it's, it's, it's to preserve human life here at this point. And we don't want to see any more casualties uh, because of this virus. So, we just have to go out there and do it. But we've been, but as, as far as I'm a, my fandom goes, you know, just, it's been crazy, you know, just going, like I said, to Arizona and Denver for, for the Islander games, watching them, seeing different arenas, seeing different types of people, everything like that. It's great. So that's the one thing that's always been the best thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So as we talked about, um, how is it affecting on the board? I know you guys recently put out a couple episodes but not getting into the studio. Talk about some of the adjustments you guys are having to make to continue to put out the content. Um, well, first and foremost, you know, Sean, Sean and I are, we've been putting out a couple episodes. I don't know if you've seen it or not. Over the course of a couple of days, we had on Marty Lyons, the New York Jets analyst, radio analyst and chairman for the Marty Lyons Foundation. So just wanted to give him a quick shout out and give him uh, some props as well for coming on and doing it from Zoom. But not even going into the studio is, is one thing. It's the best thing for everybody that's involved. And I know that uh, Matt and Brianna Peters, the owners of Gotham Podcast Studios, are doing the best that they possibly can. And, you know, we're all, we're all in this together. But as far as going out there and making the content goes, there's been a lot of learning on the fly, going out there and learning about Zoom, going out there and having to talk face-to-face -face on the computer, getting a microphone, you know, going out there and trying to coordinate different times with different guests. So uh, it's been absolutely crazy, but we've been making the best out of a bad situation over the course of, you know, a week. And I've been running other Instagram pages as well outside of my own and on the board sports. Uh, I've been running Isles Chill, been running the Blue and Orange Army for a little bit, you know, having some help there. But, uh, you know, it's just absolutely nuts. And Isles Chill is a part of the Sports Chill family. Just wanted to give them their plug as well. So, you know, we're all doing our best here at this point in time, for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. And as I mentioned, you're wearing the, the jersey today. Um, we're a week away from the NFL draft. It's gonna, definitely going to be a different experience because it's all going to be virtual. Um, we've heard the, the pros and cons. Obviously, we understand the importance of social distancing. 
Um, what are you looking forward to as a Jet fan? Before we get into the actual selection and you guys at the 11th pick, um, last year, it was, a, it was a rocky season, but you guys still made progress. You guys went 7-9, and nine and you came on strong in the second half of the season, especially when Sam Darnold was back in the mix. What are you looking forward to in this upcoming season? Um, I'm looking, honestly, for, for growth from, the, from Sam Darno, from, from the whole Jets in general. I know that their offensive line was ranked one of the worst, but uh, Joe Douglas went out and signed key guys like George Fant, uh, Connor McGovern, who hadn't had a penalty uh, in the course of a year. Uh, you know, Josh Andrews is out there, and Long Island kid Greg Van Roten from the Carolina Panthers. So, yeah, you know, we lost out on uh, Robbie Anderson, but we got uh, Rashard Perryman, good receiver, one-year, $8 million deal. Uh, he's doing his thing, it looks like. And for a guy like Sam to have him, I think it's a boomer bust type of thing for sure to have a uh, – a player like that on a one-year deal, but hey, you know, you got to go out there and roll with the punches. And just to get to the Jets for a sec, you know, their defense, signing Pierre uh, Desir, the, yeah, uh, Pierre Desir, he was with the Colts, yep. Yes, he, you know, you know all about Pierre Desir uh, very well since you're a Colts fan, Eric. So I'm kind of happy for the move. And, you know, again, one-year deal, but Joe Douglas is really working with contracts that Mike McCagnin signed, signed here last year, Le'Veon Bell, uh, you know, Avery Williamson, uh, C.J. Mosley, guys like that, you know, signed to big long-term contracts. And, you know, this is year one. We can't judge a guy off a of year one. And he came here last July. So basically when McCagney got fired after selecting his draft picks and going out there and signing, you know, the free agents like that, uh, kind of a weird spot, but ultimately, you know, this is the first year, really, for Joe Douglas to make moves and to assess uh, what players and coaches are going to be going going on throughout the whole year. So I'm I'm really hyped. I'm really stoked for this year, for sure, for the Jets. Absolutely, you, you made a great point because he came on board after the free agency period. Uh, so this is his first opportunity to kind of put his uh, stamp on the team and the, and what he wants from this team. Uh, Pierre Desir is going to be good for you guys. He's not flashy. He won't wow you with his numbers. Uh, as, but as a Colt fan watching him, he's he's a very professional cornerback. He's going to play. He's always going to be in the right place at the right time. Um, again, his numbers don't jump off the page at you. But when you have a guy like Jamal Adams that's roaming the secondary and makes all the big plays, you don't need a wow factor at cornerback. You just need a sound cornerback who's not going to get beat, or, you know, and, and make everything tough for the receiver on that side of the field. Absolutely. And, you know, to go back to the Jets back a decade ago when they had Darrell Revis in his prime shutting down every wide receiver great. The one thing that in 2010, I'll just go 2010 here, okay, not 09 when he was doing his work. But in 2010 with Revis, Revis was shutting one side of the field down. So all the quarterbacks are going on the other side of the field and trying to go in the slot and try and beat the Jets like that. Mm -hmm. With Jamal Adams having a guy like that in the backfield, he's like another linebacker at this point. But the Jets desperately, desperately needed a corner to go out and replace Tremaine Johnson after getting cut. And not only that, but they, they're going to need an edge rusher some way, somehow. And if they could get that in the third round uh, of this year's draft, we'll get more into the draft in, in a little bit. But it's going to be absolutely uh, pretty electric. So right. far from the 2020 NFL draft. Were you, how did you feel about the news? You talked about an edge rusher. Um, how did you feel about the news when it was linked that the Jets may make a play on Clowney once he brought down his salary demands? Um, first and foremost, I think with everything that's gone on with the Jets so far this offseason, again, to get back to what Mike McCagnin uh, did last year, signing guys like, uh, you know, CJ Mosley and Avery Williamson. Uh, two years ago and trying to go out there and hit, hit it out of the park with Tremaine Johnson. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if he's going to go out there and Jadavian Clowney and sign here in New York where the, the quarterback, I love Sam. I think Sam potentially can be the face of New York sports. The problem is, is can the coaching staff and, and everybody else go out there and just do it and, Personally, with everything that's gone on with with everything that's gone on with the Jets over the course of a decade, why would any free agent want to come here except for the fact that you're coming here for the money? So that's that's first and foremost. Secondly, 
uh, with Clowney, why would he want to leave, you know, to go to New York when he's playing with Russell Wilson? You know, something that I never understood. Or even trying to go over to Tennessee. I know Sean, my partner Sean, has been talking about this for the longest time with Jadavian going over to the Titans. Me personally, I think he goes back over to Seattle and he stays there. So that's just my take on on everything involved with Jadavian Clowney for sure. Yeah, I um I found it interesting because I thought, you know, the Jets were playing it very conservative to start free agency. Um, they weren't making any real moves. Obviously, they let Robbie Anderson walk on a pretty reasonable deal. Um, but I think if the price tag is right, Jadavion could be uh, another piece of that defense. Again, you talked about C.J. Mosley um, and Adams, what they do there. You add in a guy who can get to the quarterback and make their lives a little bit easier. Um, now you're looking at a, at a really good defense. I mean, the, the, the defense showed flashes last year. But again, injuries kind of took away from what you guys were doing because you lost C.J. Mosley very early in the season. Yep. And it took him a little while to get back in the mix. Mm -hmm. You guys had traded Leonard Williams. Um, so, you know, there was, there was some moving parts on that defense. Um, but in regards to him staying in Seattle or possibly leaving, I do agree. I think Seattle is the front runner. But I also wouldn't be surprised if he leaves. He's in a situation where he understands he's got to get paid and he's got to take advantage of it now. He's coming off a couple seasons where he was a little injury prone. And again, the production didn't match the talent. And so he's, if he takes a short-term deal or one-year deal at a, at a big dollar number, I would expect him to do it with a, uh, a team that's in, in title contention, um, similar to what we saw in Dominic do a few years ago when he went to the Rams and they went on their Super Bowl run. He took a big number, but it was on a one-year deal, and it was a kind of an opportunity to, to kind of represent himself to everyone. And, you know, he showed everyone again he was still a dominant defensive lineman, and now he's going on his second year in Tampa Bay at a big number there as well. Absolutely. We'll see what happens there with Jadavion too. But remember one thing, when the Texans took – it, this is a long time ago in 2006, Mario Williams. And when Mario Williams went, and I, did, where did he go afterward? Where he went to he, Buffalo. And he, he actually, Buffalo, yeah. Mm -hmm. He signed with Buffalo, and he really didn't do that well in Buffalo. Maybe, you know, there's something with the taking a defensive lineman with the first number one overall selection doesn't necessarily, you know, work out in, in the long term type of here, you know? So, we got to see what happens. I'm not comparing Mario Williams to Jadavion Clowney, but they, those, some, those situations are much, are very, very similar uh, in that regard. Absolutely. You're right. And um, not just because of where they ended up playing, but even their playing style. Again, they're not high motor guys. They're guys that are just extremely talented and they beat you off pure talent. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in some situations, they rub fan base the wrong way. As you mentioned in Buffalo, his numbers weren't the greatest, but he was still solid. He was still a Pro Bowl caliber player. But for a team like Buffalo at that time that was trying to redevelop their image and they needed someone to be the face of that defense, he just wasn't that. Um, and Jadavion could, could face the same challenges depending on where he goes as well. Yep. Um, what are your thoughts on the AFC East as a whole? Brady's on his way out. Buffalo, well, Brady is out, I should say. Um, Buffalo goes and gets Stephon Diggs. Miami, there's been a lot of chatter of what they do with their three first-round picks. Will they take a quarterback? Will they try to bring in a veteran? Cam Newton has been linked to them as well. What are your thoughts on the, on the division as a whole? The division got tougher. Even without Brady, you still got Belichick with the Patriots. They still have a top-ranked defense, even though they, they always go in year in and year out. People always underrate the Patriots. I know I'll, I'll be the first one to admit I underrate them too somewhat, but Listen, you lost out on Tom Brady, but if you could get somebody that could be a system-style quarterback, somebody that could be uh, a check-down type of guy in Bill Belichick's style of offense, hey, go for it. And, you know, Josh McDaniels is still there. Uh, why not? Uh, thing is, though, with them, their quarterback situation, I don't see them sticking with those three quarterbacks, you know, Brian Boyer being one of them. And uh, I really do see – Quite honestly, if the Patriots were to make a move, I really see them going after Andy Dalton uh, more so than Cam Newton because of how the Patriots run things, number one. And number two, Joe Burrow is going to be the franchise. I think he's going to be number one overall in, in ever, the way how it's going to shape out. And with the Patriots in general, there's, you can't doubt them. You can never doubt them, right? Then you look at Miami. You look at Miami. And you say to yourself, okay, 
Miami, they signed Brian Flores last year. They went 5-11. and 11. Nobody even gave them a chance to win a game. But yet, here they are. They wound up going up to New England, beating New England in the final week of the year. And it just rolled, it rolled with confidence with this team, you know? They still, if they re-sign Fitzpatrick as a guy that's going to be the, you know, fringe starter and whoever the, the Dolphins take with one of those three picks at the quarterback position, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. What I'm not all for for the Dolphins is – going out and seeing a guy like Cam Newton, who's Mr. Mr. Flashy, who's got the ego, who's got the personality still, but he's, you know, I, I don't want to be doubting him here, but he's injury prone. There's something along the lines of them paying a lot of money still off of that, you know, for Cam. And, you know, if it doesn't work, you know, what kind of influence are you putting on to your young quarterback there? And then with the Bills, and then with the Bills here, the Bills are the favorite in this division. Make no mistake about it. They have a top 10 rated defense. Josh Allen is only getting better. Stephon Diggs is a number one target for Josh Allen. And their running game is absolutely underrated. And let's all look back at that playoff game in which they were up against Houston. They were literally that close to going to the second round and possibly playing the Kansas City Chiefs. But instead, it didn't work. It didn't happen. Uh, but, hey, make no mistake about it. Buffalo is going to be here for the next two to three years being legitimate contenders in this division. So don't sleep on any of these teams, even the Dolphins. The Dolphins can go out there and really, really just with – way how Brian Flores is. I remember seeing the video of him cursing out referees and everything like that at the end of the Jet Dolphin game, yeah. in which they lost by a point. Uh, you know, that was just – it just shows you, like, how much fire this guy has. He reminds me of a Mike Tomlin type of a coach. And make no mistake about it, the Dolphins, give them two to three years. Give them two to three years to become legitimate – not legitimate, but – like a wild card contender in that sense. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, Buffalo is, is the obvious favorite uh, coming off their playoff berth. Um, the development of Josh Allen, Stephon Diggs, uh, that defense, which was a top five defense last year. Um, I think Miami is the wild card, though. And you're right in a lot of things that you're, you're saying. Brian Flores um, is a fiery coach with a winning background. But what to me, what makes him the wild card is we still don't know what they are expecting this team to become. We don't know the personality of this team yet. So they could do a number of different things. They may go quarterback with their pick. They may go defense with their pick and, and just keep a veteran in there. Uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick played well for them last year. And again, as you mentioned, a team that at one point people thought couldn't win a game ends up winning five games. They, they pretty much went 500 the second half of the season last year. Mm -hmm. So obviously he has a, a great, rapport with that locker room and with his team. They were willing to fight with him all the way to the end. That Jet game you mentioned, that was what, the second to last game, third to last game of the season? Something like that, yeah. And they were still fighting out there. Even though they knew that they were, they were basically playing for a high lottery, a uh, draft pick, they were still fighting for the guy. So to me, they're the wild card because we still don't know what they expect the identity of that team to be. And it not, could be a quarterback early. It could be defense early. And not only that, too, just to get to Miami here for a second, Flores in Miami, they signed a bunch of Patriots guys. Yeah. You know, Kyle Van Noy being one of them, being a solid linebacker. And his name was linked to the Jets, but he wound up going over to Miami probably for that reason to go play for uh, Brian Flores. So we got to see what happens here, man, At the once the 2020 year comes comes about. They're, they're going to they're gonna bring out the schedule, and it's going to be fun. We can't wait for that for sure. But – it's definitely going to be really, really interesting. Look. Right. Like, like you said, I, I, they're trying to create a winning mindset within that organization. And they may not be that far off from being very competitive. Um, again, we know it's a quarterback-driven league, so they've got to get a quarterback at some point. But with the right veteran in place there, I don't know if it's Cam. They may be in place for Andy Dalton. They, they might be in play for, you know, to really? bring them the in. Really, the Dolphins? For they the could Dolphins? be. I, I, again, a lot of things I'm hearing out of New England is they really like Jarrett Stidham. Now, I don't know if they like him enough to let him take over immediately or if they want him to sit behind somebody for another year. Right. But 
I mean, the things that the McCordys were talking about recently on a podcast, the things that some of the other guys, you know, how they praise this guy and the way he conducts himself, himself even last year in practice, it sounds like Bill is at least entertaining the idea of giving him the shot. Yeah. Now, I think any, any place could be in play for Andy Dalton because Andy Dalton wants to show us that he can still play. He may not be gun ho on just landing on a, on a team that's going to the playoffs. He may be willing to go to a team that has six and ten aspirations just to show us I can still do it. So that's why I say the Dolphins are in play for a lot of different reasons. You're right. It, it may not be Cam. It may be another guy, you know, but I think the Dolphins could be a wild card there. Just, just from their playing standpoint, not a playoff team. I understand. No, believe me, it's an interesting take right there for sure, you know. But also, too, you know, I just wanted to touch base on, on the Chargers here for a second and why people sure. keep on keep on just knocking Anthony Lynn and Tyrod Taylor. Mm -hmm. That duo worked very well up in Buffalo, and they made it to the playoffs, and they wound up making it all the way, you know, to a wild card round where they lost out to the Jaguars, but they still found success, and they found something. So bringing back uh, – Anthony Lynn being the head coach and having Tyrod Taylor there being the starter, you know, for, for one year, smart, smart. Well, yeah. It's very smart because Anthony Lynn has the job security now. Yes. So you don't have to rush and try to hit a home run with the quarterback. They could easily draft a guy this year and let him sit behind Tyrod for a year, maybe even two years. And a great point you made the year they were in Buffalo and they go to the playoffs with Tyrod, it was built around defense and a running game. Chargers still have all those elements. They still got Austin Eckler. They've still got a very good defense with those two defensive ends, with uh, Darwin James coming back at safety. Really They've got good, good weapons. You know, we got to see what happens there in, San Diego, in Los Angeles. Excuse me. I keep right. talking there in San Diego still. It's, it's a habit. We all do it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All good, man. Yeah, but I, I like that one as well. Like I said, San Diego could be another sneaky team, depending on what they do. They could take a quarterback and let him redshirt for a year. Right. and let Tyrod just be the veteran presence they need there. Um, in regards to the draft, which quarterback do you like a little bit more? I know you talked about Joe Burrow going number one, but if fully healthy, and, and let's say Tua comes in, clean bill of health, which quarterback would you prefer? Uh, I'd rather prefer the kid from Oregon. I'd rather prefer the kid from Oregon, to be honest with Justin you. Herbert. Okay. Justin Herbert. I'd rather prefer him. You know, listen, Tua, they say he's got deadly accuracy, but, you know, one hit, He's been concussed. His knees are brittle. Everything like that. You've been hearing it a whole nine yards with everything with two. And now with Miami, you know, with them, they need – we talked about it. They need a quarterback in the worst way. And they need somebody that's going to lead them to it. It could be that guy. He is a great dual-threat quarterback. We're not going to deny that. But at the end of the day – when you're going to take somebody off of potential and then he gets hurt and then everybody's, oh, well, what if they took Justin Herbert from Oregon? Uh, who knows? Who knows what might happen, you know? So, or, you know, maybe they take a quarterback later on with one of those later draft picks. And, you know, Jake Fromm could be that guy from, you know, uh, out from Arkansas, Georgia. right? It was Georgia. Georgia. Jake Fromm, yep. Mm -hmm. Jake Fromm from Georgia. You know, so – He's a good quarterback, and nobody really gives him the credit or anything like that at all. But, again, this league is a dual-threat league, and if they could go out and get Tua, and the one thing, with, like I said, with, with Tua is just him getting hurt. One injury, that's it. You're going to hear from the media the, the firestorm, crazy stuff going on. Why, why, is, why they draft him? Herbert is having a solid – solid career out in Los Angeles or wherever he gets drafted, you know? So there is that aspect to it. You talk about dual threat quarterbacks and that, that is all the craze in the league right now. That's the trend. You got to have a guy who's mobile. What are your thoughts on Jalen Hurts? Do you feel he has the potential to be successful or is it going to be, is, is he a long-term project at the next level? I mean, we looked at Pat White back in 2008, Another, another Dolphins quarterback draft pick that got, you know, that got basically put in. He was supposed to be the Wildcat guru. Didn't work out, you know. Ryan Tannehill, four years later, same thing. But with, with what you're saying with uh, Mr. Hurts, look, listen, we got to see what happens here uh, with, with the dual threat quarterback for sure. Uh, 
you know, he could be a project. Again, you, you never know with what might happen. And there's so many factors that go on and happen in the NFL draft between, or even when a player's mind for that matter, met, is he mentally ready? Is he physically ready? Is he somebody that's going to go to a team and not pout and not complain and not be a pain in the ass? Or is he going to be a guy that's going to go out there and he's going to be a team guy and somebody that's not going to cause, you know, chaos in the locker room? So that that's all the stuff that goes into it. So to be honest with you, I don't know. I think he could be he could be whatever he wants to be at this point in time. So we'll just wait and see what happens there with uh, with Mr. Hertz. Okay. Um, so now with the eleventh pick, what are you expecting from the Jets at that spot? You know, I know it's a week away, but I honestly really believe. I really, really firmly believe that the Jets are going to go offensive lineman with their number 11 overall pick. Now, with that said, the Jets haven't had a wide receiver drafted in the first round since Santana Moss in 2001. And the last time the Jets drafted an offensive lineman in the first round, the Brickshaw Ferguson number four and Nick Mangold in the late 20s. So that just goes to show me that, you know, Every other year, besides 09 and 2018, where they drafted Mark Sanchez and Sam Darno, both USC quarterbacks, uh, it's been defense. And they've been trying to go out there and beat Tom Brady. They've been going out there and trying to beat the New Englands of the world with defense. But it never worked. It never worked. New England always found a way to win. And for the Jets, it's just been rebuilding, 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 rebuilding. They need offense in the worst way, and they're going to have to find somebody to protect Sam Darnell. I, like I said, offensive lineman, who's going to be on the board? It's going to mix and match. It's going to mix and match here because you see a lot of these uh, draft specials, and you see Andrew Thomas getting taken, number four. Then you see Mekhi Becton going, you know, the same spot, number four being the first offensive lineman taken off of the potential in his seven-foot wingspan. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Tristan Wirfs is another guy. And, uh, you know, am I missing anybody else? No, those are, the, those are the main names that are being floated around. Right. Like you said, in that range, anywhere from four down to 11 um, with the Jets. Do you now, as a Jet fan, would you be comfortable taking the old lineman instead of taking Judy or C.D. Lamb? Yes, I would. I definitely would. If, listen, here's the thing. Okay, the Jets right now with everybody that's in place with Josh Andrews, Greg Van Roten, uh, McGovern, and Fant, these guys are only here for a temporary amount of time. Let's face it. Let's be realistic. These guys, yeah, they got their paydays. I'm happy that they're Jets, but they're not going to be somebody that that's going to be, you know, that that final piece. Those four players I just mentioned, they're not the final piece here. Now, anything can happen, anything can change. But with that said, you know, you look at a guy like the Brickshaw Ferguson when he was here with the Jets and he protected Chad Pennington, Brett Favre, Mark Sanchez, Geno Smith, you know, and the same thing with Nick Mangle. Go offensive line. Find a way to build your team from inside. And that's what Joe Douglas is. And he's patient, and he's an offensive lineman type of guy. So I expect them to go. Now, I'm not going to lie to you here. If the Jets did take Judy or CeeDee Lamb or Henry Ruggs III, I won't be mad at that either. But here's the thing. Three to four years, five years down the road, if one of those three players are still on the Jets, that are wide receivers, I don't want to see, and you're going to hear it in the media, I don't want a diva receiver because of where he got taken in the draft. And then if he makes a highlight play, everybody's going to be flocking to that player. No, I want a, I want a receiver that's going to keep his head down and just go to work, not even paying attention to what's going on in the media. That's what I want to see if the Jets take a wide receiver. I get what, what's going on in the world. I get that 100%. But – if they were to take one of those three wide receivers, I won't be mad. Just I don't want it. I know what's going to happen in three to five years. If something like that does come to a, 
uh, fruition, you know? So I, me personally, I think that they're going to go offensive line, but I won't be mad if they take a receiver either. I, so I agree. And that's why I wanted to have this conversation with you because I feel the Jets are in that very unique spot in the draft. I think every year, the number one pick isn't always the best spot to be in. Sometimes you've got to fall a little further down. Sometimes you've got to be a little further back to really get the talent that's, that's really there. And I think the Jets are in a unique spot because you've got the young quarterback, right? You've got the head coach who's supposed to be the quarterback whisperer. So in order to make this work, you've got to get him protection. And a couple of years ago, when, when my Colts and your, draft, and your, your Jets made a trade on draft day, mm-hmm. we did it for that reason as well. We moved back because we had our eye on Quentin Nelson. We knew we needed to keep Andrew Luck upright and getting Quentin Nelson completely changed our offensive line at that point. Ryan Kelly at center got better. Anthony Costanzo at the left side got better. And immediately we went from having one of the worst offensive lines to having one of the better offensive lines. And now they consider us to have one of the best offensive lines in football. And I agree with you there. But I hear a lot about Jerry Judy and some respected receivers in the league say he's probably one of the most polished wide receivers to come out in a long time. His route running, his, his ability to get open down the field, his ability to beat man coverage and double coverage. You talked about uh, Harry Ruggs. Ruggs is more of the, the, the deep threat, the guy who takes the top off, but he's, he's not as polished. So it's going to come down to those two guys. And that's why I asked the question, because if Jerry Judy is the next coming of Julio Jones, uh, no disrespect to any old lineman you draft, it will always be looked back at as you guys missed the opportunity to draft a difference maker for your quarterback. I totally get that 100%. You know, but like I said, usually the first round draft picks with the receiver, and I understand that this is a draft class in which the receiver is much, the receiver position is much deep, like very deep. Like you could draft somebody that could be a home run hitter in the third round, fourth round, somebody late like that. But how many times do you get to see an offensive lineman at number 11, or even one of the top four picks, for that matter, coming out. But we always hear it all the time, the dreaded P-word potential and going out there and playing, you know. It's just – it's crazy what's going on. But, like I said, me personally, I would rather see them go offensive linemen just to protect Sam and develop holes and block and blocking everything like that. Because, remember, that's how the Jets in 2009 – were the number one overall rated rushing attack. And when you had Mark Sanchez going out there With and Nick being Mango. the Mr. Game Manager yep. for the rookie, they made it all the way to two, two AFC championship games. And they found the receivers. They traded for the receivers afterward. But long, long behold, you got to start up front. And that's the way how you win ball games, and that's the way how you win championships. I agree. I agree. With the young quarterback, you've got to get the line. And that's why I say I, I, I would not be surprised either. I think that is the right way to go. Uh, I, I just find it very intriguing for the Jets because they land at that spot in the draft where they're going to be looking at some, they're going to be looking at some big playmakers there and they're going to have to make the tough choice of do we appease um, the highlight reels and the fans that want the flash or do we appease, like you said, our tradition and what's best for our young quarterback. And so it's that, not even it- it's, I'm sorry, but it's not even appeasing the fans. It's just more about protecting the quarterback here. This is your franchise investment. Right. For the next but, three to five years. Right. But, so, but, you brought up, but you brought up a great point. As you said, the, the headlines are geared towards the fans. So, like you said, if, if, if Joe Douglas feels that Judy or CD is the best player at that point and he takes them, that's still another toy for Sam Darnold. That's not – I'm not going to – I'm not going to – argue with you on that right one, right because so, it's need a wide receiver better right too. and so that's why i say the, the the intrigue there becomes do you take what's overall best for the for the team and like you said makai beckton might be rated higher on their board they may feel makai beckton is a better fit and if we can get him at 11 take him at 11 even though the, there are these extraordinary receivers there the fans may want the receiver because that's the bigger name but beckton might be the better fit and ultimately, we're going to see what happens there. How would you feel if the Jets trade out of that spot to collect more assets? I would, be, I would honestly be thrilled if they did that. And, you know, if they could go out and some way, somehow find a wide receiver, 
uh, at number 18 or whatever it is. I know I've been hearing rumors about the Falcons trading up and the Jets getting offered, you know, swap of first round picks and a third couple of third rounders or fourth rounders here and there, whatever the case may be. But remember, when the Jets were great in the early part of the millennium and the early 2000s and the middle 2000s and even at the end, they hit home runs in the later rounds and they got guys like the Justin Millers returning kicks. They were on top of being in the uh, top 10 special teams. Now that's, that goes in hand in hand with Mike West, West off, everything mm-hmm. like that, you know, but it's, it's just one of those things where you got to go out there and just, you got to build your team. That's how the New England's always find a way. Teams like that find a way with drafting players like that. But it's all about the mindset up here, and you have to just literally, if you're Adam Gase, just – I think he's almost – call me crazy. But with the way how he conducts himself in these interviews, he kind of reminds me of Bill Belichick in that sense. It's crazy to say, it's crazy to say that. Crazy to say that. It's a very bold statement. But it's – he just reminds me of that – in a sense where it's just like, you know, he just stays silent and he's just trying to make things work. And it's almost the same thing what Bill's doing, but because of the fact that the Jets are losing, number one, because the Jets have been losing over the course of, you know, his time. And number two, look, no, none of his coaches have argued with him last year over this. There was no breakup. There was nothing like that. They found a way to win games. And they were literally one or two games away had it not been for the Miami loss at Miami or the Cincinnati loss. We could possibly be talking about a playoff team with these Jets. So, again, all I'm saying here is, you know, let's – if the trade were to happen and you could go out there and basically say, all right, you know, what are we going to do here? If they, if they build their team up like, like this, and remember, Atlanta is on its last hinges with Matt Ryan and Julio Jones, so of course they're going to want to hit a home run. And they got uh, Todd Gurley, too, in the offseason. So they could go out there and just make one more run with it and try and build with that offensive tackle or try and put Calvin Ridley and Julio Jones together with another receiver at that point in time. It's possible. It's possible that it could happen. But – the Jets, like I said, earlier on in the millennium, they had they found ways by winning games with their offense, their defense, and their special teams. And that's how they did it early on in the millennium. That's all I'm saying. So I would I would be I would be happy if they traded out at number eleven to get more draft picks. That's just me personally talking. No, no, I, I completely understand and I get it, man. Like you said, you you gotta win on all three phases of the game to be a competitive team. Yep. Um, you can get by some days just winning with your defense and some days with your offense, but that's not going to get you consistent wins. Uh, so you got to do it all three phases. I'm looking forward to what comes next week. Let's shift gears a little bit. Um, I know you're a big Yankee fan. It's been a tough uh, spring for you guys. Obviously, the news of Hank Steinbrenner the other day passing away. Yeah. Um, but there were a lot of injuries mounting up. But obviously, we're, we don't have a season at this point. Um, what do you think ultimately happens with the Major League Baseball season this year? Um, I think it starts up. I know Sean and I, we've been talking about dates. I know we talked with uh, uh, Brian Hoke today from MLB.com with the Yankees, and he's looking at, you know, maybe like July, July 4th. Even a, a guy like Matt O'Leary, he's a diehard Met fan. He does his thing with eyes on aisles. He was saying July 4th as well. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. I think there's going to be a baseball year for sure. The problem is, is where were these games going to be played at? We've been hearing with Governor Cuomo now that, you know, there's not going to be anybody going outside till May 15th. And, you know, it's, it's crazy what's going on here in New York for sure. And you're, you're in the city. I'm out in Long Island, Eric. So it's just absolutely crazy uh, what's been going on. But as far as baseball goes with the whole realignment of the divisions, like, you know, and I get why they did it because of where spring training is and everything like that and where, Uh, you know, these players are, but, you know, we just have to look at it and just understand one thing here, you know, sports, unfortunately, we all miss sports, right? 
but we have to be smart here and basically say like, all right, what's going to happen here with baseball? What's going to happen here with hockey and basketball, everything like that, that's going on. So with, with baseball, I want to, I would personally like to see the season back by July 4th as well. I mean, that's plenty of time, you know, you figure out what's going on with training situations, everything like that. Division realignments, you're talking about playoffs. Now you're talking about eliminating all-star, the all-star game this year, and just, you know, go right into the playoffs right, right after that. And you're not really losing out on much, you know, and plus with the Yankees, I know you mentioned the fact that they had a couple injuries, Aaron judge. He's basically, he fell, uh, he broke a rib in the, in the, before the playoffs last year and he was playing through pain. Uh, James Paxton, he had to get assist out, but he's going to be back in May. Severino is out with Tommy John. He'll be back next year. The Yankees are in good shape. The Yankees are in good shape to say the very least right now. Do you, do you feel that there is, um, I mean, we've been hearing a lot with the NBA, obviously they're in a different situation because they were at the end of their season, but do you feel the league has to get started by a certain date in order for us to really enjoy the, the totality of a major league season without it just being forced? Um, as far as what the MLB goes. Yes. Like for, and the reason I say that is at what we understand that major league baseball is a long season. And as you talked about the training, the conditioning, getting guys back in game shape as fans, we don't want to get cheated. Right. Nobody. So, right. Nobody wants it, but I'm just saying just fans of this particular sport, we don't want to get cheated. We, we want to be able to, even if it's a, a condensed 80 game season, we at least would like to see that. Do we get to a point where we say, look, it's just too far and it's too late into the calendar where we can't get it? I think it's going to happen, though. The season's going to happen. I don't think they're going to go that route. And, you know, at some point in time, the world's going to have to come back to normal here and normalcy at this point. Uh, Personally, I can't see baseball, you know, not being played. I know I probably went on Twitter and said, cancel the season for – the NBA and the NHL at this point in time, but I don't think they won't. We've been hearing rumors that they might be starting up in the summer and sacrificing some of their time for the next, uh, you know, for next year for sure. But, you know, these guys are human beings too. They're athletes. They're humans. They're like us in a sense. But again, anything is, uh, anything is possible. But I do see Major League Baseball, though, starting up sometime soon and we're not going to get robbed of anything at all okay all right I, I'm, I'm hoping so I, honestly I felt really good about my Mets this year um I, you know I, I'm saying I believe Add, that they're going to do good too I, I felt good I mean you know adding Batanzas um trying to strengthen up our bullpen a little bit I thought Diaz would be better this year and then ultimately just getting a, another look at Peter Alonzo you know he really carried us last year and it's always great when you have one of those young stars. You guys know. You guys have plenty of young stars over there with the Yankees. Yep. So it's always ex- an exciting time of year. Um, you, you touched on it as well. NBA, NHL, they're in a very tough spot. This would have been playoff time for them. As an Islanders fan, do you think you're going to get to see the Islanders again this season? I don't think we're going to see hockey. I don't think we're going to – well, they did say that, you know, there's a rumor going about that the, that the league is thinking about playing in the summertime. If they're going to – Again, you're going to have to open things back up and you're cheating the fans here at this point. You know, it, that's something that's not a good thing uh, for sure. But there's something along the lines of like tainted and then, you know, like in 98, 99 with the Spurs, people right. consider them champions, you know, but because of the fact that there was a lockout, this is much different. This is a much different time right now. But with the Islanders, though, they were one point away of looking looking on the outside, looking in at they're starting off really hot. Uh, you know, to be quite honest with you, who knows what might happen. They might bring in, like, the best 24 teams at that point in time or ha- how whatever the case may be. But, you know, make no mistake about it, I feel as if the, the Islanders needed this break out of any team because they had guys that were hurt. They had guys that were, you know, coming back. And, yeah, they were finding their way in Vancouver a little bit before they would have went over to Calgary. But make no mistake about it, teams like that needed a a little break. But as far as the summertime goes, 
I'm just going to say this right now. Just cancel the winter sports. Just cancel the winter sports. You focus in on next year. These players don't want to go out there and get hurt and trying to travel across country, everything like that. Just, just cancel hockey, cancel basketball. And let's not worry about that because these guys are human beings as well. Do we all miss sports? Do I miss the Islanders? Yes. Do I miss basketball in a sense? Yes. But these guys have families. These guys are human. Just cancel the year and just call it the way how it is. That's it. I get it, man. I completely understand that thinking as well. I've kind of said the same thing, man. So we'll wrap it up on that note. Will, I appreciate you stopping in. Um, I'll be looking forward to see what the Jets do next week. And uh, we'll touch base after because, I, you know, it's, it's going to be news no matter what, whether they go O-line, whether they go receiver, it's going to make news. Absolutely, man. And, you know, we'll see what happens come, uh, come next week for sure because you know how the Jets fans are. Come the NFL draft, they'll always cheer or boo no matter what. And then, you know, it takes some time to be uh, getting used to in New York as well. So, Eric, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate this. And one more thing. Quick shout out to all the essential workers out there. These guys are killing it, guys and gals. Whether you're a doctor, you're a nurse, an EMT worker, a fast food worker, grocery store worker, construction worker, or whatever type of essential worker you are, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Absolutely. I share those sentiments. I share those sentiments as well. Again, Will on the board sports. Check them out. Will, shout out the IG page so everybody can take a look at, at the work you guys are doing over there as well. Sure, sure. So uh, we've been trying to get on Twitter as well, at On The Board Sport. That's O-N-T-H-E-S-P-O-R-T, On The Board Sport. And on Instagram, we're on On The Board Sports. Just add an S to it. Uh, we have a website, www.onthebordsports.com. We haven't really been blogging that much. We've been doing our own thing trying to book guests, trying to do everything that it is, trying to post content. And the main thing here is, you know, it's just making ourselves out there and knowing that, hey, you know, we, we may be regular working people, but we're also sports fans and you never know what might happen in the future. So it's always planting the seeds now. Everybody keeps on talking about the, uh, the overnight success and the roots are plenty big. Yes. So that's the way how it is. So you know, we've been doing this for a year and a half, two years. I know you guys at Real Fans Real Talk have been doing your thing. Shout out to you guys as well. You guys have been killing it with the content. I know that. Uh, we, we just like trying to stay patient, but stay productive, man. Put out as much. Um, as you know, you, we've had these talks off air. Um, it's not just about the current sports. We just love and enjoy speaking sports, man. So we try to put out as much as possible. Like right. I said, we respect what you guys are doing. We're paying attention as well. And that's why I wanted to take this time and get together and let's just talk, man. Absolutely, man. Hey, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure today, Eric. I really appreciate it. I hope you and your family are safe throughout this whole situation right now. Likewise, man. We, we staying indoors, but we're going to keep working, man. That's it. All right. We out of here, guys. Peace out, guys. Be safe. Smush Parker here, formerly up to the Los Angeles Lakers, and you are now tuned in to Real Fans Real Talk. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real 